Okay. Ah, yeah, yes. I've uh, said it. Yes. Okay. So let's start in uh, maybe one minute. There are yep. 12 we attendees. Have, we already have 14. Good. I think the number of registration is 50. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe but, later more people will join. Yeah, let's wait for a minute. <laughs> Probably uh, they are coming gradually. Uh, so now it's time to start. Shall we okay. wait? Uh, no, uh, probably. Uh, they will join uh, while you're, you know, speaking some uh, uh, introduction. Okay. So let's start. So, yeah, let's start slowly. Okay. So, firstly, uh, thank you very much for joining in our webinar out of your busy schedule. Uh, my name is Satoshi Takayama. Uh, one of the co-founders of our company, Financial Partners. I'm also in charge uh, of supporting uh, overseas companies, especially in industrial and machinery and component sector to enter and develop their business in Japan. Another co-founder is Yasushi Hasegawa. Uh, he will do the main part of this presentation after I introduce our company. The topic of this webinar is how to develop OEM business, OEM customers in Japan. In this presentation, we'll explain that your Japanese customers are located not only in Japan, but also outside of Japan. Therefore, the opportunities with them are actually in all over the world. But firstly, I'd like to let you know that uh, at the bottom of uh, this Zoom screen, you can find Q&A panel. So during our presentation, if you have any questions about our presentation or uh, Japanese business in general, please use this Q&A panel to send you a question. Then we will answer to your question during this presentation or at the last part of this presentation. Also, if you have questions about a specific industry, uh, or about your company's business in Japan, then please contact us by email to reserve a separate online meeting with us. You can find Yasushi's email address in his first invitation email of this webinar, uh, which is uh, marketing at fenetre.co.jp. We are happy to answer to your questions and support you for your future business in Japan. Also, after the seminar, uh, if you'd like to have a presentation material, please send an email message to Yasushi, then we can send them to you later. So uh, please uh, go to the next page, Yasushi. Okay, so this page shows the agenda. Yasushi will explain uh, why uh, you should target Japan and understand uh, Japan customer first and reality of marketing and sales activities in Japan, uh, options of marketing entry mode, case studies, and Q&A. Okay, then please go to, yes, next page. Uh, so with this page, uh, I'd like to introduce our company briefly. Our company, uh, Fenetro Partners, is one of the leading consulting firms of trade, investment, and international marketing based in Tokyo. Our clients are medium to large size companies, mainly from the US and Europe. We also have many clients of overseas governmental organizations to support trade missions and foreign direct investment. Uh, the main scope of our service is market entry support to enter Japan, not only by market researches or consulting, but by implementation. 
And this implementation means, for example, uh, business development and lead generation. And uh, this is our company's strengths. What we mainly do with this implementation is sales and marketing activities locally in Japan on behalf of our clients. So we work as if we are your local Japanese branch. We currently have 28 staff and we have worked on more than 300 uh, international projects uh, since we, our company was established in 2008. Then please go to the next page. Yeah, uh, this page shows logos of our past and the current clients. As exper explained earlier, we have clients of many uh, European American manufacturing companies and also governmental organization. Industries of our clients are mainly industrial machinery components automotive. But we also have a, a customers uh, of consumer products. And from next page, my colleague Yasushi will explain the main topic of this presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I'm Yasushi, another co-founder of uh, Financial Partners. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar tonight, uh, tonight for Japan, but uh, in the afternoon or in the morning in your time zone. Uh, I'm very happy to share our experience and uh, insights about the uh, market entry into Japan with you. And uh, hopefully you can find uh, new insights and ideas how you can develop your customers in Japan from our presentation. I'd like to start with uh, this section, why Japan? So let's get started. Um, you can find some figures uh, to explain how Japan is. So I'd like to pick up some figures. Uh, population is one third of the US uh, and uh, GDP is one fourth of the US roughly. And the GDP growth is almost nothing. And uh, the shocking figure on the slide is here, GDP per capita, which is less than 40,000. Uh, actually, Japan was ranked world number two 20 years ago, but now it's ranked 26th. So uh, Japan is getting poorer and poorer. Uh, I, I think still some people believe Japan is a rich country, but uh, it's not anymore. Another shocking data is uh, here, uh, median age. Uh, it's getting close to 50 years old. So now Japan is the uh, second oldest country. Uh, the first one is uh, Luxembourg. Probably uh, retired rich people prefer living in that country. Uh, but in OECD countries or big countries, Japan is uh, far oldest. So um, the reality is uh, Japan is getting poorer and older. So uh, if I'm you know, making and selling consumer goods, I wouldn't choose Japan as my destination. So let's go to the next slide, uh, which explains uh, uh, our economy, GDP. So um, unfortunately, uh, uh, we don't have any growth. Of course, these are small up and down, but uh, almost flat uh, since early 1990s. Uh, and the China uh, overtaken Japan uh, probably 2008. So their GDP is like this. Now their size is almost double of Japan. Uh, actually, Japan had their uh, good era uh, in 1970s to 80s. At that time, the gross rate of GDP was uh, between five and 10. Uh, it's like uh, current India or China. So uh, our you know, uh, economy was getting better and uh, probably some of you can remember what happened in the US. In 1980s, Americans did Japan passing. Some American laborers destroyed Japan cars and complained uh, that the trade Export from Japan is unfair. Now, and you know, the U.S. is doing the same thing to China. Uh, at the time, you know, uh, Japan was, uh, you know, number one in terms of economic growth. But nowadays, uh, you know, the, uh, we can't expect a big growth, and this 
last year, you know, we had the minus several percent uh, in our GDP, and uh, this year probably uh, it will recover by a few percent. So this is the reality of uh, the economy of Japan. Uh, I calculated the uh, GDP growth over one, over 100 countries which have uh, GDP data uh, in the last 20 years. Japan was, uh, you know, worst. Uh, uh, the GDP growth was just 8% in 20 years. And uh, it's 80% in Germany and 1,000% in China. So uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the situation in Japan. And, uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I believe still Japan is an attractive market for particular type of products. Uh, this is a good example. And this chart shows uh, the number of cars sold in Japan. Actually, uh, about 30 years ago, uh, 8 million of cars were sold, but now it has declined by 3 million. And now uh, it's about 5 million. So, so my question is, uh, do you think Japanese car manufacturers are doing well? Uh, actually, uh, they are really doing well. It's a really uh, tricky situation for you, but uh, uh, you can see this chart. Uh, as I explained, uh, domestic sales is remaining at 5 million roughly, but uh, actually same amount of cars are exported to foreign markets. So that's why you know domestic production remains at the uh, 10 million level. In addition to that, many of car manufacturers produce and sell outside Japan, like in the US, China, India, and Europe. So they are growing by global expansion. This is a, a, you know, a bit tricky, but a, a reality of uh, manufacturer, Japanese manufacturers. Uh, OK, let's go to the next. Uh, and uh, I explained the, uh, the example uh, in the automotive case. But you can find uh, uh, other type of manufacturers on this list. Uh, this list consists of uh, uh, top 20 manufacturers in terms of uh, net growth between 2005 and 2014. That data is a little bit old, but please remember what happened during this period. Uh, financial crisis in 2008 and the big earthquake in 2011. So uh, Japan uh, economy was at the bottom at the time, but those players earned a lot of sales and increased their net sales during that period. Uh, actually, the domestic market situation was terrible, uh, but they, are, uh, they were growing at the time. The reason is here, overseas sales ratio. For example, Honda and uh, over 80% of sales outside Japan. So you can see other companies like uh, uh, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries or Daikin, air conditioner company, uh, Sumitomo Chemical, Sony. So many big Japanese manufacturers are growing by global expansion. So uh, this is our, uh, the secret. Uh, why uh, Japan is a still attractive market for industry players. So uh, on, on this slide, uh, you can see the very interesting uh, uh, research, uh, which was conducted by Ahaka Japan, or uh, uh, the Chamber of Industry and Commerce of Germany, uh, Japan office. Uh, they distributed the questionnaires uh, to their membership, uh, which are uh, German companies located in Japan. So uh, the question is asking you, uh, which is bigger between A and B? Uh, B is the uh, sales revenue directly from the Japanese companies. A is the uh, uh, sales revenue from Japanese companies located all over the world. And 48% answered A is bigger than B. So, they are doing business in Japan, but they are more outside Japan from Japanese companies. And surprisingly, 21% uh, answered 
uh, A is four times bigger than B. So, uh, so this is the reason why still many American and European companies are seeking opportunities in Japan. So their goal is not to sell in Japan. That their objective is to develop Japanese customers and deliver to Japanese companies located all over the world, like in the US, Europe, China, India, South Africa, everywhere. Uh, probably some of, you got, some of you guys think uh, you can directly sell to Japanese companies in the US or Europe, for example. So it's uh, partly true. If you are selling cheap or commodity parts or tools, uh, you can directly sell to uh, Japanese companies uh, located outside Japan. But if your products are you know, very Im important uh, to determine the quality of uh, final products like a car, construction machinery, or a medical device, your products should be chosen by a decision maker in Japan. Uh, so you have to close a deal with a Japan a decision maker in Japan, and then you can start a business discussion with uh, local people working in the uh, subsidiary of a Japanese company. So uh, this is a, a background. Why still many American and European companies are seeking opportunities in Japan while the Japanese economy is not doing well. And this is our additional information. Uh, this is our uh, FDI, stock, FDI stock in Asian countries. Uh, these guys are investors. Uh, those guys are a destination. So you can see uh, Japan is the number one investor in many Asian countries or number two. It means if you do business development in the other um, Asian countries, you often encounter Japanese customers. But the problem is uh, their subsidiaries in Asian countries uh, don't have a, a decision maker. Uh, so in that case, you have to do business development in Japan. So if you really want to expand your business in other Asian countries, uh, definitely it makes sense. You do business development in Japan as well. So uh, this is a conclusion of the uh, first section. So in general, Japan is not a good market, especially in the case you are selling to average consumers because they are getting poorer and older. But uh, industry sectors are very attractive. Uh, the reason is uh, they are, uh, uh, Japanese manufacturers are growing by export and many of them produce and sell more outside of Japan. So, uh, if you are selling to big manufacturers in advanced engineering sectors like automotive, construction machinery, agricultural machinery, automation, robotics, so uh, I like to recommend Japan as your target destination. Okay, uh, from this chapter, uh, I like to explain uh, how you can develop Japanese customers, but uh, before uh, explaining how to do it, I would like you to understand your customer first, because uh, uh, working culture, HR, career, or anything is in Japan is different from the US and Europe or uh, from other Asian countries as well. Uh, this is a uh, unique, very unique HR system in Japan. So, um, first of all, uh, Japanese companies usually recruit new graduates, hundreds of new graduates at the same time. It sounds like a boot camp of US Marine. Uh, they accept hundreds of new graduates on April 1st at the same time. And they start their career from uh, 22 or three years. And Many of them prefer uh, lifetime employment. Uh, they will keep working for the same employer until 65 years old. Uh, so it's not regulated by laws, but uh, most of Japanese companies have a retirement regulation. So 
they usually release uh, people at the age of 65 years old. Uh, performance doesn't matter. Uh, that's why my company is taking advantage of that. Uh, we try to pick up very you know, high performing uh, guy uh, at the age of 65 or six. Uh, so uh, this is a reasonable, you know, our cap strong capability of business development in Japan. And uh, this is our, uh, another aspect of very unique HR. Um, salary increase like this. And uh, actually your performance doesn't matter. You have to be uh, waiting to become 40 years old to be a manager or uh, 50 to be a senior manager. And the limited people will be promoted to a higher level to a director or a board member or like that. So this is a, a typical HL system in the big manufacturer. So the problem is they don't have a strong motivation to achieve something because uh, performance doesn't matter on their salary or bonus. So uh, their you know, most important thing is to keep their position in their uh, organization. So that's why uh, they don't want to take risks because there's no fruits, but it's risky. So um, when you try to replace existing products by yours, uh, you will face this problem. Uh, they, their way of thinking is uh, safety first. Uh, achieving goal is uh, maybe a second. Another thing is, uh, 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 tricky thing is our organization. Uh, sometimes we receive an inquiry about uh, business matching. Some, some companies say, uh, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to ask you arrange meetings with C-level of uh, Japanese companies. But the uh, uh, reality is, you know, in Japan, uh, very top level, uh, do nothing. Uh, I mean, uh, it, they are like a sinecure or a honorable posts. Uh, you know, they are not busy. It's somewhat different from the US and Europe. Most of the actual work is planned and done by middle managers. They are really busy and working hard. And, you know, they plan something and try to get an approval to higher level and implement it to bottom level. So um, decision makers are not doing very high level. Usually they are in middle level and sometimes lower uh, because uh, in the big manufacturing company, uh, jobs of engineers are break down into hundreds or several small parts. So a manager can't understand uh, in detail of each part of our equipment. In that case, you know, one uh, engineer, junior level, uh, has a right to choose a, a component in some cases. So another uh, tricky aspect is uh, this, this one, consensus base. Uh, in the US or Europe, you can identify a decision maker but in Japan, it's very vague. Uh, sometimes uh, we say the decision maker is uh, the atmosphere in their organization. So nobody knows how to make a decision. So they have a lot of meetings to get the approval from here, from here, have, a, you know, have to persuade some staff, engineers, and finally they make a decision, but uh, nobody can tell how how it's made. And uh, another tricky thing is the uh, back, backroom deal. Uh, in the final presentation, decisions are uh, always made. So um, presentation skill is uh, almost you know nothing in Japan. Everything is determined backroom deal. Sometimes at the bar with drinking beer. Um, this is a reality of uh, the organization of uh, your customer in Japan. So in that case, uh, please understand, it takes time for them to make a decision and you have to 
understand the situation and uh, you spend time to support someone to get the approval from a higher level or to persuade uh, their colleagues and subordinates. And this is important to, to sell to a big Japanese company. The background can be explained by a famous framework, Cultural Dimension, uh, developed by Hosted. Uh, you, you can easily find this tool uh, to compare different culture in different countries on the internet. Uh, I'd like to explain why Japan has such a business culture by using this tool. Uh, first of all, uh, Japan has very high score in uncertainty avoidance. So basically, uh, people are risk averse, especially in big company. Uh, people are super risk averse. And they have very long term orientations. Uh, they don't want to change their employer or supplier as well. And the masculinity is very high. Uh, they, uh, they love uh, competition and uh, uh, they, they, you know, uh, sacrifice their family and personal life in order to achieve organization's goal. They work really hard until late night, as I'm doing. Uh, but uh, in, some, in some European countries, uh, the culture is very feminine. It's a school of Netherlands. You prioritize your personal life and family. I really envy that. But... Uh, in Japan, it's different, uh, super masculine. And uh, when you try to persuade your counterpart in uh, a Japanese customer, uh, those three factors would be obstacles because they want to keep a long-term relationship with existing customers and they don't want to take risks. And uh, you are competitors, Japanese local suppliers are really masculine. Uh, they work hard until late night in order to meet the requirements from a, a Japanese customer. And uh, this culture was made by uh, samurai era. Uh, probably uh, some, some of you uh, got aware of this culture, Harakiri. So when samurai made a mistake, uh, he has to compensate in this way. Uh, actually, uh, it was abolished recently, like uh, 150 years ago. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, the reason why we have such kind of obsession. So nowadays, uh, luckily, we don't need to commit suicide anymore. But uh, mentally, uh, we have to do that. So that's why you know Japanese people are uh, super masculine and uh, they don't want to um, make any mistakes because they like to. Uh, avoid uh, such a situation. So, uh, so now you got somewhat familiar with the Japanese business culture. You, your uh, target customer is really tough. Uh, so in this section, I like to explain the reality of marketing and sales in Japan. Uh, first uh, obstacle is the language. Uh, I think one, less than 1% 1 of our population speaks English. Sometimes European people ask us, how many languages do you speak? But the uh, answer is always one, 1.5, I think. So uh, if you send emails in English, probably it directly goes to a spam holder or they just simply ignore. And please do not make a phone call in English. You just make them feel uncomfortable. Uh, you know, you will just make them panic. And uh, all documents must be written in Japanese. And all services must be provided in Japanese language. Uh, of course, big manufacturers have a, a limited number of Eng English speakers, but they have to report to their bosses who don't speak English. So if you are lucky, you can encounter good English speaker in a big Japanese firm, but uh, Finally, you have to submit all the documents or any kind of services in Japanese. Uh, this is our uh, first obstacle. And uh, this is our sales process in Japan. Uh, 
when we work on business matching or a meeting arrangement for our clients from the US or Europe, people think, you know, it's just a meeting arrangement. But, uh, you know, it's super difficult in our society uh, compared with the open and flexible country. In open and flexible country, you can easily get the appointment of a first meeting, open discussion, because people are open, flexible. Probably the economy is growing. They are exploring new products. You can easily get a meeting. And then your potential customer will start a technical discussion with you, and you will have a negotiation with them and reach an agreement. Uh, probably uh, it's much shorter than Japan. But in open and flexible country, you will have a, a lot of troubles in implementation. Probably you have to go forward and back forth. And sometimes your customer try to cancel an agreement or try to change the scope of work or conditions, uh, which might be problematic in some cases. Uh, but in Japan, you know, uh, it's very difficult to get the appointment of the first meeting. Uh, they are really, you know, uh, conservative. They hesitate to meet a new supplier, especially with a foreign supplier. So you have to pass a gatekeeper and uh, have a communication with a very junior level. And uh, the problem, another problem is they ask hundreds of questions to you before the first meeting. You have to answer to the kind of questions in detail. Then the junior level person can get the approval uh, from his boss for arranging a meeting with you. So uh, it's a really you know tough process, even for uh, Japanese. And then uh, they keep technical discussion, and they need a lot of time for their international internal negotiation. They need to make consensus. And they will ask you to come back to Japan again and again to have a meeting. Then uh, finally, uh, you can reach an agreement. But good news is, uh, you know, everything goes very smoothly on implementation. The way of working in Japan is really well organized. So you don't have a lot of trouble once you got an agreement from your Japanese customer. Another obstacle is communication. Uh, the way to communicate in Japan is really indirect. Uh, people just imply. And the important information is always hidden between the lines. Uh, and they don't like discussion. Uh, you know, in the meeting, they just you know, uh, give a presentation or a briefing exchange information, then they always say, please bring it back to my company and have an internal discussion, and then we come back to you. Uh, they don't want to make a decision in a meeting or joining the discussion uh, because they need to make consensus in their organization. So it's really inefficient, especially for American. You know, I think you guys make a decision very quickly. And uh, People prefer uh, documents in detail. Uh, speaking blah, blah, blah is not preferred in Japan. You know, people come, they don't speak a lot, but, you know, they like to exchange a lot of documents in detail. Uh, probably it's made by education style. In the US or Europe, you guys have a lot of discussion or you, you do a presentation, but in Japan, you know, uh, we just, uh, you know, read text, listen to a teacher, and uh, memorize everything. Uh, that is a Japanese style. So that's why we are not good at presentation, discussion, or English as well. And uh, this is a really tricky point. Uh, people tell you a sweet lie uh, with sugar coating uh, because you know, they like to avoid a conflict with a foreigner, uh, in, especially in foreign language. So that's why they always say to you, yes, interesting, welcome to Japan. But later on, you will find they ignore your following up email 
uh, it's really tricky. So um, uh, this is our, uh, the difference in communication style. Uh, low context means uh, everything is explicit. High context means everything is implicit. So uh, you guys are here, but Japan is here, you know. It's super different. So for Japanese, it's very easy to understand what Americans or Germans are speaking, but uh, it's very difficult for you to understand what Japanese people are thinking. So, uh, uh, so I, I believe uh, you need to help uh, from a local expert, uh, Japanese. Uh, this is our, about a customer relationship. Uh, the biggest uh, difference from the US or Europe is uh, the relationship between manufacturer and the supplier is not equal. In the US or Europe, manufacturers, suppliers, equal, and uh, you have a, a good relationship and you, you can have a discussion. But in Japan, uh, large manufacturers treat tier one, tier two supplier as their subordinate or sometimes slave. Uh, you know, they give you suppliers command and control. Uh, so when you try to sell to a Japanese big manufacturer, you have to be super humble because they think, uh, you know, they are, you know, uh, at the, this, this position and you are at this position. They may look down. Of course, they don't speak in an arrogant way. They are really polite, calm. But uh, in their mind, uh, they think in this way. And, and this is our uh, uh, industrial uh, group uh, ruled by large manufacturer. It exists in some industries like automotive. Uh, for example, Toyota has a Toyota suppliers network. Honda has a Honda suppliers network. And the Honda suppliers cannot have a business with Toyota. Nowadays, it's been changing. Sometimes uh, ex an exception happens, but uh, still many Japanese manufacturers have this way of thinking. And uh, when you try to develop Japanese manufacturers as your customer, personal relationship is very important. Uh, probably uh, the most important aspect in sales is to make your counterpart feel safe, uh, especially in the case uh, he has a request from his boss, you should not ignore that. If he has a defect on your products, you have to do anything to solve this problem. In, in, otherwise, uh, they feel uncomfortable, unsafe with you. And uh, for making a personal relationship, you visit your customers very often. Nowadays, you know, under COVID-19, uh, it's impossible. Now, uh, many Japanese companies accept uh, meeting offer online, like on Zoom or uh, Teams, but uh, no, nobody knows how it goes after COVID-19. But I believe still many Japanese customers require you come to their places, offices, factories. And uh, another important point is uh, quality. Uh, they are perfectionist. Uh, they have a strong fear of failure because they have to commit a suicide, harakiri. Of course, I'm joking, but uh, they still have such kind of mentality. That's why their way is uh, really micromanagement. And if, you, if your products have defects, you are required to submit uh, uh, hundreds of pages of corrective action report. I don't say hundreds, but tens of pages. And uh, they ask why five times. For example, if you report, it was caused by personal error on this production line. Your customer asks you why, and you will explain something and they ask why. So uh, it's a Toyota way, why five times. Uh, it's really you know, annoying to uh, logical and radical engineers working in the US or Germany. Uh, this is a good example. Uh, this is a specification provided from a Japanese manufacturer to a 
Chinese factory. Uh, it's a production outsourcing case. It's a very, you know, simple specification, but you can see uh, this is from a Japanese company. It, surprisingly, uh, both products are almost same, but the way of making a specification and giving a requirement from a Japanese company is always like this, uh, micromanagement, because they want to eliminate any aspects which can be related with troubles, defects. So uh, when you work with the Japanese companies, uh, you will be frustrated with this culture. So if you are a manager of business development, your important role is to persuade your engineers to, to, to meet this kind of requirement. I know uh, most of American and European engineers don't like this. Okay, uh, in this section, I'd like to explain some uh, options of market entry modes uh, to Japan. Uh, I'd like to explain some uh, basic conditions. Uh, this is a framework of industry life cycle. As I explained, uh, Japan was on the growing stage in 90s and 70s. Now India is here and I think China is getting close to the ceiling of their economic growth, maybe in the coming decades or two decades. But now Japan uh, has started declining in many industries. Um, uh, I can name some typical dying industries, apparel, furniture, a motorbike, um, wedding, or uh, many. Uh, Many consumer goods industries are dying. And, uh, and in industrial sectors, uh, since they are exporting a lot, still, you know, the stage is here, not shrinking, but not growing. In such situation, usually oligopoly happens, uh, meaning the market is dominated by limited number of strong players. In that case, uh, distributors usually don't have a strong motivation to invest in new product because the, the market structure or market share has been fixed. It's very difficult to change the structure. So uh, for you, you, know, you can develop, develop Japanese customers outside Japan as well, but uh, for local Japanese distributor, Japan is everything. So the market is, has been fixed and uh, they don't have a strong motivation to invest in selling your products. And in some industries, uh, distributors don't sell. Literally, they just distribute. This is a, a case of uh, American supplier to automotive and construction machinery. Uh, the company, expected distributor try to sell their products to uh, their end users. But the reality is this, uh, distributor just purchase many components or equipment and deliver to end user for just, just in time delivery. So uh, in this case, you have to do sales activities directly to end user A and to, to uh, have a technical discussion. If end user A agrees to buy your products, they will talk to distributor and you need to talk to distributor. And this guy uh, work on just in time delivery. So uh, this is reality. In this case, you have to have someone working on the ground in Japan to visit your target end user. And you might think this distributor should sell your joining. Okay, uh, <laughs> sorry for the trouble. Uh, I changed my Wi Fi. Um, okay. I, I forgot <laughs> where I was speaking. Uh, for this distributor. Uh, yes, I see you are not sh sharing your screen. Okay, okay, let me do that. Uh, Can you see this? Yes. 
Okay. Okay. Um, there's no difference for distributor uh, to buy from your company or uh, from existing supplier because uh, the price or profit wouldn't be different. So uh, they don't have a strong motivation to source a new product. And uh, please be careful. In some industries, uh, you know, having a distributor may work, but in some industries, your distributors never try to sell your products to end users. And uh, this is a framework to choose uh, the best entry mode to a new market. Uh, this uh, vertical shows the degree of risk. This horizontal shows the degree of control. Uh, for SMEs, I know the ideal way is a trade because it doesn't require investment at the beginning. But the problem is uh, you can't control this guy because they work for their own interests. In addition to that, uh, as I explained, the market situation or economic situation in Japan is not good. So most of the distributors are passive to start selling new products instead of Japan. So you have to have another option for some industries. Uh, our recommendation is you hire someone working on the ground in Japan uh, because uh, uh, that, you know, the most popular way uh, for having uh, your sales in Japan is direct investment. You set up your subsidiary in Japan and hire local sales, but it requires uh, not small money. Uh, probably you have to spend half million dollars. If you go very swift way, uh, probably it could be a quarter million, but it's still expensive for SMEs, especially in the first few years, you can get sales because you know Japanese customers' decisions are really slow. So I believe it's not a good idea for SMEs as your uh, first step. So that's why I recommend you hire someone on outsourcing base, uh, sales and marketing agency like us, and make them to develop your customers at the same time, uh, control distributor or support technical discussion or marketing of uh, distributors activities. At the same time, you can explore uh, M&A opportunity, joint venture opportunity, and if it goes well, finally, you can make a decision uh, of direct investment. You, I think you can justify if you have already developed some customers uh, on outsourcing base or uh, through a, a distributor. But I know uh, just having a distributor would be the ideal case for you because it doesn't require a cost. However, uh, there are a lot of uh, disadvantages. Of course, you have advantages. You can immediately uh, get the first market experience and the uh, risk and investment is low. And uh, you can take advantage of their existing customer base, hopefully. But sooner or later, uh, the sales hit the ceiling because, uh, uh, you know, again, the market share has been fixed in Japan. And, uh, uh, the number of customers your distributor has will be limited. And those are uh, disadvantages of just having a local distributor. Uh, no customer relationship, no deep technical discussion. Uh, most of the distributors don't like get involved in a deep technical discussion. They expect you do it by yourself. And uh, you can't get the market information including uh, uh, pricing, end user pricing. And uh, most of the distributor has limited uh, market coverage. Some distributors focus on a single industry or a single application. And uh, uh, extreme cases, uh, uh, they just work for a particular company group, like Toyota Group. In that case, uh, they just cover uh, part of the whole market. 
and you can't control sales activities. You can't control end user pricing. And the uh, service level should be low, especially at the beginning of the uh, market entry. And uh, for distributor, uh, it's none of their business to sell to Japanese companies located outside Japan. So uh, they can't facilitate uh, the kind of uh, you know, uh, expansion, your business expansion. And uh, the last point is you never know why your business doesn't grow in Japan if it doesn't grow, uh, because distributors don't disclose important information to you. They always hide, for example, contact information with their end users or uh, some requests about pricing or so this is a limitation of just having a local distributor. And uh, I'd like to explain uh, some case studies, uh, how to develop Japanese market by our clients in industrial sectors. Uh, before getting to the case studies, I like to explain uh, the limitation of market research because we sometimes receive inquiry about market research. I can say it works well in consumer goods industry. Uh, we can arrange focus group interviews or uh, you know, uh, distribute the product sample and get feedback from uh, uh, consumers. It may work well, but uh, in industrial sector in Japan, Market research is like scratching the surface of the market. You cannot get the real demand on your products or uh, marketability of your products. Uh, first of all, it's very difficult to reach a key engineer uh, for your product. As I said, uh, jobs of engineers are broken down into small parts, hundreds of small parts. So it's very, really, you know, uh, taking time to identify a key engineer, which is familiar with your products. And then uh, many of uh, Japanese business people are really shy and uh, uh, they are conservative. Uh, they usually reject that kind of meeting offer. And uh, even if you have an appointment, they don't speak honestly to you. Uh, in the first meeting, you have to make a personal relationship by visiting him again and again. And researchers and consultants usually don't have a deep technical knowledge. So they can't uh, get their uh, real demand from engineers. And if your products should be customized, only interactive way uh, can show you real marketability because you give uh, a presentation to them and they will uh, give you some requirements. You provide specification, test data samples. Finally, uh, you can get the uh, probability uh, to sell your products to that customer. So our recommendation is test marketing on outsourcing base, press uh, strategy planning at the same time. I believe this is the best way uh, to establish your market entry strategy for Japan in industrial sectors. The first case is our, uh, suppliers to plant equipment. Um, plant equipment used in oil and gas industry or uh, water treatment and the like. And what we did is uh, uh, we worked the uh, marketing and sales rep of that country uh, company in Japan and uh, our uh, staff uh, had the product training for several dates and uh, we translated the marketing material and we research, conducted the research uh, to identify potential customers and uh, visited them, most of them, and had a technical discussion. And we found the challenges. Uh, the first one is uh, their products can't be adapted to the Japan voltage standard. And they need to invest a million of money uh, to adapt. Uh, and as the beginning of market entry, they are not confident if they should invest. The second challenge is uh, uh, somewhat serious. The strongest competitor has uh, advantages in both quality and price. So uh, uh, it's not, you know, uh, ideal situation. 
but uh, our staff and my colleague Takayama san visited many Japanese companies and had a lot of discussion and found strategic target market segmentation, which is our export market. So uh, this is our client and uh, they provide the components to a plant equipment company in Japan and they export products to different countries. In this case, uh, you know, Japan voltage standard doesn't matter because the final product is used in different countries like in Southeast Asia or Middle East. So they, uh, they create uh, fast changes. And another uh, challenge was solved uh, by their uh, competency. Uh, they have a very extensive network of maintenance outside Japan, most part of the world. So uh, this uh, Japanese customer export product to different country, but if the components is provided by a local Japanese company, this guy can't work on maintenance properly. So, but our client has a maintenance network in this country. So uh, this is an advantage for our clients. Finally, the client increased sales and uh, they made a decision to send an expat who speaks Japanese uh, from their Asian headquarters. He's Korean and now he's working in Japan. And at the same time, they started their partner search for m and and partly our firm supported this activity as well. So what they did is they started business development on outsourcing base uh, with paying like a thousand euros per month. And we worked on business development. And then uh, they found their, uh, or uh, established their market entry strategy and developed uh, distributor as well and uh, the, they terminated the uh, contract with us because they have already established the uh, potential customers in Japan and they sent an expert and they uh, that person control distribution ch channel and uh, provide technical support to them at the same time they are seeking among the opportunities so uh, I think it's a very you know smart way uh, they started the uh, uh, with a you know small start on outsourcing base, and develop their potential customers, and they got uh, confident, and finally made a decision to hire a Japanese-speaking guy and send him to Japan. Another case is a uh, uh, component for industrial electronics. Uh, what we did is same uh, with our previous case. Then and their challenges were uh, they have wide range of products. And uh, their products cover a wide range of applications and industries. And uh, we uh, developed a distributor for this company, but the distributor had no idea uh, where is the target segmentation. So my colleague Takayama-san and our staff visited many customers and had technical discussion and finally identified uh, only these products is uh, very competitive in Japan. And uh, probably uh, it's more competitive in this industry. And our distributor, or well, their distributor in Japan, started focusing on those guys visiting and uh, you know, introducing their products. And finally, uh, they increased the sales revenue in Japan. Actually, our farm was working for this company for eight years, I think. And finally, uh, they established a very good relationship with the distributor, which was developed by our staff. Uh, the owner of this distributor invested in our clients. Uh, you know, it's a financial uh, relationship, partnership. So uh, this is our, uh, another success story. So what they did is they hire us as their sales rep in Japan on outsourcing base. Uh, with paying several thousand dollars per month. And we develop the distributor and our staff control distributors and supported their uh, technical support. Finally, 
it, it started working very well. And uh, they uh, terminated the contract with us. Uh, we usually call this situation, happy graduation from our service. Uh, it's not uh, good for us in terms of sales and profit, but uh, it's a really important credit for us, uh, success case. Uh, you can find the testimonial uh, that he wrote to us on our web page. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, final slide. Uh, this is a recommendation to you. So please do not waste a lot of money for research and consulting in industrial markets. Uh, I recommend you work on test marketing and the strategy planning at the same time. And uh, test marketing, including sales and uh, technical discussion can be outsourced to a third party like us, sales and marketing company. And if it goes well, you can take the next step to setting, setting up your own subsidiary and uh, hiring your own sales or M&A or a joint venture. So uh, I think this is the uh, smartest way uh, to develop Japanese companies in Japan. And then if it goes well, I recommend you arrange your salesperson to take a business trip to other markets, to Mexico or India, uh, to develop your customers, uh, Japanese customers in uh, other countries. Uh, it's really working well. So again, uh, if you have a closer deal with a Japanese company in Japan, we will have opportunities to sell your products to Japanese companies outside Japan as well. And uh, this slide shows our services. Um, I, I uh, recommend uh, you work on uh, business development on outsourcing basis, basically, but uh, we can provide any kind of services for your market entry into Japan. So I hope you can get the new insights about the Japan market and the Japan business today and hopefully uh, we have a chance to work with some of you guys in the near future. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you very much, Ayasoshi, for the presentation. Uh, it's actually uh, time to, 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 to finish the, today's uh, webinar. And uh, during the uh, presentation, we through the chat, we got uh, one question. So maybe how about answering just one question? Okay. Actually, I've already answered through the chat, but uh, for example, a uh, question is that, uh, how long uh, does it take? Is it expected to go through the Japanese sales process? So that means how long does it take to do the sales oh, activities? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it actually depends on the on the industry and market, but based on the, my, my experience in Japanese automotive industry, uh, uh, it took uh, us like a, a few months, like a three months to six months to reach to the key person, key engineer. Then, uh, it, then we started the sales activities, but it doesn't happen that they will immediately purchase the product. So it actually took like a three, four, five years to until the first start of the sales. And during that period, we regularly contacted uh, this the customer person to continue to draw attention from them by sharing some interesting information from the US or, the, or from Europe. Then we kept contacting him. Then finally gave, they gave us an, an interesting opportunity to propose the product. So it generally takes much longer time than Europe or the, the US. So this is our experience. And uh, maybe one question, uh, how about the IP uh, protection, patent flooding? You don't need to be worried about that. Mm. Uh, Japan is very different from China or other Asian countries. Mm. Uh, people are really strict with any kind of regulations and laws. So um, you don't yeah. need to worry. Okay. Then I think uh, there's no other question to be answered. But if you need, uh, if you have some uh, question, please feel free to answer. Uh, uh, send email to our email address, uh, like marketing at fenetre.co.jp. Also, if you'd like us to send you the presentation material, also please send us an email. Then we will get back to you. And I, I have an additional one. Uh, I'd like to ask you a favor. Uh, I will upload the webinar report on LinkedIn. And please uh, 
uh, leave your message if you find uh, something interesting in our webinar today. Uh, probably I will send you the link of the post, maybe tomorrow. Uh, thank you for your cooperation in advance. Yes. Then, and thank you very much again for the participation uh, in our web webinar. And we hope our webinar was informative to you. Then we look forward to receiving your message in case of any question or request. Okay, then thank you very much once again. Then I wish we wish have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. And see Bye. you. Bye.